we're looking to, you know, do really good solid work to improve the properties and then hold them, you know, for the long term. Two of my partners are um, in tech jobs, I would say, that they want a runway so that they can, you know, move on from that. And I think that they both separately are at a place they could move on and they're, they're planning to here shortly. Um, but with that, we're looking at these as not a temporary, you know, a quick fix. Um, we want to, you know, to acquire, to improve, and then to really operate efficiently, you know, for many, many years and to do right by our investors as well. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig, and with me as always is John Cohen. How are we doing? Oh, we are good. We are like 15 days away from the end of the first quarter of 2021. Scary. It is crazy. Um, scary, crazy, how fast time flies. But yeah, no, it's uh it's crazy. Yeah, I was at the bank yesterday just getting something signed and I just asked him, I was like, what's the date? And he's like the 15th. I was like, holy shit, it's already halfway through March. And then basically at the end of the first quarter, and it's just, I don't know. I don't know where this year's gone. No, it's crazy. I think, you know, almost a year ago at this point, when I mean, this comes out, probably not so much, but almost a year ago is when we shut down, right? It was like March 15th of last, or 12th, March 12th of last year, we were in the office. We're like, I guess everyone worked from home, right? Next thing you know, you know, I feel like it's deja vu, right? I'm sitting in the same place I was a year ago and it's like, oh, okay, we'll see what happens. But um, no, it's crazy. It's uh, It's just nuts how fast time flies. It's wild you bring that up. I remember just sitting there and I was kind of looking at each other like, eh, should we, shouldn't we type of thing? Like, you know, because it was small. It's just the four of us. It's not like we were a big office. And, you know, we said all our desks were pretty spread apart for the most part because can't stand you guys anyway. So it was just <laughs> as much space as I physically can. Um, and yeah, I guess, I guess in hindsight, we made the right decision, right? To do it yeah. that early instead of wait longer. But and yeah, that's crazy. And and the, the conversation we're having now is, do we get rid of the office? I mean, you know, a year ago, we never, now we're having a real conversation. It's like, we've been really efficient, you know, 3,500 bucks a month in rent. And then you got cable and, you know, internet and all that stuff on top of it. You know, do we need it? You know, it's been, it's been over a year into the office 20 times, 25 times. So it's like, you know. Well, you're not paying me anymore, so you guys can afford. It. Yeah, we can afford the office, right? It's a, it's a trail trade off. So no, but you know that's real conversations that's being yeah. taking place. So we'll see how it shakes out. That's for sure. You're probably one of the last people to be having that conversation. I'm sure most people are having that conversation, you know, six nine months ago, and you guys are you know late to the party. Well, yeah, yeah well, you know, Don, 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 I think he lives in the office. So yeah. it, it, it took him a long time. You know, he's been in Florida for the last four months. So it's like, well, you're in Florida for four months. I'm here. You know, basically we're paying $4,000 for a mailbox. <laughs> you know, we have a ton of mail being delivered. I mean, what's the point? And he said, I was actually thinking about that the other day. You know, we really don't need it. And I was like, you know, well, listen, that, that that's more money that we could use for better resource. That's a full-time employee at the end of the day. Right. You know, so it's, it's, there's a trade-off. So we're, we're, we're having the conversation. Listen, we, I wanted to have that conversation March 13th of last year, right? But um, be that as it may, who, who, you know, we didn't think, did we think we'd be this efficient, not together? I, you know, I don't, I thought it was, you know, I don't think anyone thought it was going to take this long to, you know, sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel, but that is what it is. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it's an interesting place we're in. It's a new world. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be making, similar decisions. So I think it'll be yep. interesting to see what happens, you know, a year from now, kind of where we're going to be at and, you know, the way it played out, especially now as more and more vaccines are rolling out, things are starting to open up and, you know, we'll see if people, you know, want to get back at least in some sort of hybrid fashion. So it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens. Um, but let's jump into today's episode. We got a really great guest on, excited to have her on, hear her story, learn from her and just have a awesome chat. So Josie, thank you so much for joining us. 
Hi, Chris, John. Thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. So kick us off. Tell everybody a little bit about you, your background, and you know, kind of your journey a little bit. Sure. Um, so I was solidly on a career path and had a couple big epiphanies. And I think this maybe sounds similar to a lot of folks that get into this industry, um, but it led me to multifamily. Uh, you know, my background is military. I went to the Coast Guard Academy in Connecticut and then um, you know, served for several years with them. I'm still in the reserves, but switched to you know business um, and eventually ended up as a consultant at an engineering firm. I have an engineering undergrad, business uh, graduate degree, and did that for a number of years. It was an amazing job. I was climbing the ladder, um, and uh, one day, essentially, you know, maybe over the course of many days, you know, found myself very burnt out. Um, I tend to throw myself into things, and had done that uh, to the sacrifice, perhaps, of um, some things that were really important to me, including. Um, my health, my family, I've got three daughters and my husband, I like them all. I want to see them. And I was traveling like 75% of the time leading this really large program, um, for an engineering, you know, fortune 500 company. And at the same time had some of these, you know, really hard for me, at least, you know, personal, um, losses very close to me that were just eye opening and, um, it took me a while to, you know, kind of process through that and, and to gain the perspective and to act on the perspective that's that you have when your life just kind of stands still. And I do believe everybody has those moments. Um, I've had a couple now. And finally, you know, started to transition from my corporate job uh, more than a year ago and start diving into real estate. As I saw it, it is, you know, the promise of, of the passive income is great. Um, you know, but I really just wanted something that I was passionate about and really excited about. So I started in single family investing, did that while I was still working, went through a course like so many people. Um, and it was focused on by, you know, learning how to invest and really buying um, single family homes in the Midwest. But I knew kind of with that perspective I had gained, um, I knew that I really wanted to, to go bigger I knew that there is nothing guaranteed in life, that things can happen and change in an instant. And I was kind of tired of waiting around and grinding and really, you know, wanted to, to drive. Um, so, um, yeah, I started to transition out of my job as I was buying some single family homes, went to a conference and just start really networking um, with other multifamily investors. I went in the middle of the pandemic. So as you guys were just talking, it's been a crazy year. Um, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, I really, I took time to, to narrow down the market I wanted to invest in. And I, I live in Colorado and I had a number, I did this whole analysis of uh, markets throughout, you know, the Midwest and in um, and the Southeast, Jacksonville was on it, uh, my list as well. And narrowed it down to Kansas City through rent to price ratio, as well as uh, population growth and um, job growth. You know, I kind of did a crosswalk with uh, some of the, um, the KPIs there and um, or I guess just metrics. Picked Kansas City because I could drive there in the middle of a pandemic. And I did, and I actually, um, before I had a property to look at, you know, I, I wanted to go bigger, which in my mind at the time was get a commercial loan. So something, five units and up, um, drove to Kansas City, convinced the broker to come out of quarantine to meet with me um, and just really started developing relationships. I met the banker, um, my banker, uh, met uh, two property managers and um, and then drove home and it's 10 hours. It was actually really nice solitude and nice to get out of the house. Mm. A month later, you go to a conference, uh, realize I'm thinking too small, with, you know, the five to 10 units um, called the broker back and said, I, I want more, I want to go bigger, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm up for the value add in, you know, along my path, I've done a lot of project management, I've managed programs for large infrastructure and facilities. And so I knew like I could handle the value add piece. So long story short, I ended up buying a 24 unit property. It was significantly mismanaged from, um, you know, mom and pop in Lawrence, Kansas, 
and, you know, have a full rehab pro, um, budget and project that we're working on right now to turn that property. But in the interim, I was continuing to network. I found a group of uh, investors, you know, who were invested in Kansas City. Through that, found my now business partner, who I have GP'd on three different deals, um, and we're under contract right now on two more. And that really just, the momentum really took off when I found, you know, found good, solid people to work with. I think it was, it's been really amazing going through, you know, the 24 unit myself. I've learned a lot of lessons. It's not always easy. It's not always rosy, you know, and now I get to, um, you know, to, to leverage skills and, you know, a, a great team to, to get into bigger deals. So with that, I created my company, Waypoints Equity, Waypoints speaks to the those different turning points you have in your life. Um, similar to those epiphanies that I've had that, you know, really define who you are. And I find, you know, that the impact you make is now is, is those points between, between the waypoints. Um, and it's been fun. And I'm doing my own thing. You know, I left my job in um, July, which was a little bit accelerated, but I learned about bonus depreciation and being a real estate professional and the tax savings that I've had. And I actually was up pretty late last night wrapping up a couple of tax things on March 15th, but the tax savings that I've had this last year through being a real estate professional and, and bonus depreciation, you know, offset a good chunk of my income as well. Um, so it's, it's, you know, kind of a win-win um, and that's it. That's me in a nutshell. Awesome. I love it. I think, a lot of things you touched on, I resonate with. And I think one of the things that's really interesting to me, because John and I have spoken about it a lot when we talk to people is, you know, as you're looking to start investing, let's say, or, you know, go to new markets or change, it's really taking that time to sit down and, you know, not get pigeonholed into, hey, here are the top five hottest markets and, you know, just picking one, right? It's really taking the time to sit down and analyze and understand you know, the levers that are driving different markets and why you like one versus another one. And, you know, understanding that just because somebody likes this market or thinks it's good, it may not fit for what you're looking to do and vice versa, right? There's a ton of people that are looking for heavier appreciation, which, you know, isn't, you know, Kansas City is not going to be the heaviest appreciation market, but then there's tons of people that are looking for more cash flow or, you know, affordability, you know, different things of that nature. So I think, you taking the time to really sit down and say like, Hey, what am I looking to accomplish? What's my criteria? What do I want to go into? And then finding that bucket, that area is something that everybody should be doing. So I love to hear that you did it. And I'm sure it's helped you a ton and was able you know, to accelerate, like you said, not only you leaving your job, but, you know, finding your first 24 unit, as well as then, you know, finding other deals to be a GP on. Yeah, I really think the focus it gave me once I made that choice, you know, was is so key. And I, right now, I'm, I've got great momentum, and he, the networks are just so powerful. Once you're in a market, mm-hmm. you know, I now know five different lenders. Um, they know me, insurance. You know, I've got two contractors I work with, um, and they are, I trust them, you know, completely. And it's so huge. I mean, my I've made a commitment. I go out there, you know, once a month. Um, just to oversee now all the properties that we have and all of the rehab. Um, but yeah, the it took me a while to find that market and it was a little frustrating. I really was trying to force what I thought was a good market or a good idea into a motto and the numbers just didn't work. You know, I would love to invest in Colorado and be able to like touch and feel it every day. And it's just not going to happen. Not for, not for the same results that we have, you know, with um, cash flow and that type of thing in Kansas City. And I looked uh, looked other places as well, um, but yeah, I think I think that was huge for you know really focusing um, on where I wanted to go and, and what I wanted to grow. Mm-hmm. No, I love it. I think that's awesome. I think it's really great too that you know you took the time to really sit down and network with people and learn and you know decide early on going from you know five unit to a twenty four unit is the route to go and then eventually, you know, scale up even bigger than that. I'm really curious because you said, you know, you've learned a ton in that first deal. And, you know, I think anybody that has done their first deal and is, you know, 
either a few days afterwards or several months or several years later, you know, probably something similar to say, I'm curious, what are some of the bigger things you've learned as you've undertaken that? Okay. So when you say bigger, you might mean more painful things to learn. <laughs> sure. Um, so going through the lending process, you know, I worked with a local bank and they were phenomenal. Um, what I didn't realize, and I don't know that the lender caught it out, you know, was that there was a requirement for an interest reserve, which is very, very common, you know, with agency debt. Um, and this was not uh, agency debt to have the COVID reserve. But at the last um, minute, the bank came back with interest reserve requirement that I had to find, you know, an extra $30,000 to just sit there. And I had not planned on that. And that was that was painful. Um, yeah. So that part stunk. <laughs> um, but I, I, I did get a great loan, you know, it's a, a bridge loan, um, you know, and has been working well. We've got a $370,000 budget for the rehab. Um, other lessons learned, you know, just, you know, been in project management for a while, but it's really different when it's your money. You know, I've always had a contingency, um, in the budget, um, the what I think would be good advice for anyone going into this business um, is to keep a contingency, but don't advertise what that is. Who knows what your contingency is? It, as soon as your contractor or you know anyone that you have working for you, they're they're going to consider that part of their budget to work with, and. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, overlap there where I thought I had a cushion, um, but my contractor, you know, essentially was considering that his fees, and that was just due to communication as well. So I'm a little tight on my budget. Um, we found a couple great uh, cost savings along the way, um, and so that's helped with, you know, we got a new roof that was. Um, you know, significantly less than what we were originally planning, um, as well as decks, which is surprising um, due to the cost of wood right now. Um, so that's been able to help. But the other, you know, the, the lesson I'm going through right now is um, just, you know, old buildings have old problems. They got big problems. This building is from 1962 and had not been maintained for decades. Um, I knew that there was some kind of drainage issue, some kind of backup in the main hallway. And the previous owner actually was a plumber and he kind of danced around this issue and, you know, talked it away. But um, right now I'm dealing with a $60,000 insurance claim because this has, I know. So actually I have this sticky note over here. In the same week we found termites, we found um, water damage, the, um, the drains in the hallway backed up and the passageway packed, backed up. And um, we had asbestos in the same week. And I wrote it on a sticky note. I'm like, it's going to get better from here. <laughs> it's gonna be okay. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I think I'm pretty, you know, realistic with, you know, what is coming down the, part, the pike with this, um, with this property. You know, I've been rolling with, you know, things that come up. But it really felt like a punch in the stomach when I got this bill and it was $60,000. And I... It just kind of froze. I'm like, oh my God, like, okay, take a deep breath. And, you know, I just poured through my insurance policy and, you know, and they've, you know, they're covering most of it, but yeah. Yeah. It's big, big pro properties is they're a big deal. You know, you have mm -hmm. to be ready for, you know, the unknown. Yeah. So I think what you kind of just described is probably a, a fear for a lot of people. And it's something that you are going through or have gone through fairly recently. And I think it's always, you know, we've had those problems and we talk about it and what we went through, but I think it being a little bit fresher for you could, you know, be insightful for a lot of people. So how have you been, you know, not only handling this from, and you touched on a little bit, but you know, just the financial side, but also like the mental and emotional side, like how are you able to like, just deal with it, you know, figure out a way, push through and not feel like, you know, I invested all this money, even extra money than I thought I was going to. And it's not like, you know, blowing your world up. Yeah, I think just keeping, you know, the bigger perspective, you know, this property is in an amazing location. It's one block from KU. It's surrounded by several other small multifamilies, like, you know, similar to itself. 
but they are all in good condition and they're operating really well. And this one was a little bit of um, the ugly duckling on the block. And so I know that once we get it over that hump and we're pretty close to, you know, you know, transitioning it to a, a solid property that it's really going to perform well. And it's going to perform well for a long time, especially if we do all of the rehab and all of those major and address all the major issues now. Um, and I keep that in perspective, you know, I really have faith that this, you know, that this is a solid uh, property and it's, um, uh, it's going to perform well, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been, it's been fun. <laughs> it has been fun, actually. I mean, running through all of the different pieces and, and being able to, you know, design the, the path forward for a building and a community is, is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. And I think, you know, that's kind of the mentality you have to have of, you know, not getting lost in the trees and really looking at the forest and the big picture and understanding, okay, you know, we're in a tough spot today, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. And, even if there's really not, you know, a whole lot of light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, it turns into just a, you know, a not so great project, you know, you're going to learn a ton and, you know, the amount you're going to know to look for in the future for similar properties. I mean, you know, it's just, it's tough to put a number on that. Right. So I think even from that standpoint alone, right, this isn't the only building you're ever going to do and you've gone mm-hmm. on to do others and the amount you're learning here is only going to make those other ones better. So I think, that is a big part of it. And it's funny, I was actually uh, earlier this morning, I was talking to a guy who is looking for, he's got this like little six unit literally around the corner from where I live, which is kind of the only reason I even considered it. And he was like, would you want a partner? And we're talking, he's like, yeah, it's super clean. This guy's owned it forever. She's like, you know, we turn it probably doesn't need a lot of money. I was like, I was like, buddy, this thing's built in 1920. I was like, if you think this thing is not going to need money and you're planning on owning it for 20 years, I was like, you're kidding yourself. I was like, yeah. from the pictures, it may not, it may not look like it needs work because the cabinets and the counters and the flooring are similar to everything else there. But I said, this thing's a old, old building. I mean, it's almost a hundred years old. I was like, I said, you have no idea how this guy's kept up this property and he's owned it for like 30, 40 years. So this guy's owned it for forever. I was like, he may have done the best job in the world, or he may have done the worst job in the world. And you know, you're just taking this guy's word for it and he hasn't sent you a ton of info. So I was like, even if he's done the best job in the world, like you said, these old buildings, they have old problems and you're going to have to fix them. And, you know, the older it is, you know, sometimes the the bigger and more costly they become because, you know, it's easy to fix the cabinets, right? It's easy to fix the flooring. But when you start talking about, you know, foundational problems or subfloors or plumbing, you know, electrical yeah. stuff in the walls, you know, those are the things that become a problem and a lot of people don't want to pay for. So uh, I think it's just interesting to hear you talk about that. And I was literally having that conversation with someone and he didn't want to hear it. So uh, it's just funny to me. Um, so what have you been doing now? You know, you said you're doing some GP stuff as well, partnering with people. Is that in similar type buildings? Are you doing different things, larger properties, bringing on capital? Like how are you looking Uh, at the stuff for these other buildings? Yeah. I mean, if we fast forward to now, um, you know, we've got two properties under contract. Um, I'm leading the acquisition on a 60 unit townhome property north of Kansas city Mm -hmm. and it's going well. We're raising $2 million uh, on it and we're pretty close to three quarters of the way there. And that is a 506 C offering. Um, and then um, my partner is leading uh, acquisition on a 42 unit in the historic Northeast of Kansas city. And that um, that's a value add property. And we're raising uh, just under a million dollars. And that has a really large rehab budget. So we've done a number of deals together now, and um, really they are one of two types. And um, this would be, our second stabilized property, the 60 unit, is um, you know it's it's going to be cash flow from the beginning, and um, we closed in January another stabilized property that is 100 years old, um, but it had a full rehab on it, and it's just gorgeous, big brick buildings um, in you know the north of Kansas City as well. So we have found you know synergies, I would say, working together and kind of backing each other. You know, my name part, uh, my main partner's name is Nate Morris. Uh, he runs Real Smart Asset. And um, 
he's been investing in the area in Kansas City for a couple of years and has seen, you know, some properties through, you know, the full cycle there and was looking to grow and expand. Um, and I'm just, I jumped on with him on an 80 unit deal south of the city, um, right at the same time I was closing my 24 unit and was able to add value to his team through, um, you know, basically running with tax uh, and legal you know, work for him. So he didn't have to worry about, you know, getting the cost segregation study. Cause like I said, I was on a mission to um, minimize legally minimize taxes and, you know, all, and maximize benefits. Um, so jumped on that 80 unit property with him. And as we were out there closing on that, um, our other partner, uh, we've got, there's three, there's four of us all together. Our other partner is the property manager um, for all of these deals. And he's phenomenal. Uh, he had found off market a property that had um, that a young woman had inherited from her mother who had recently passed, and uh, uh, he was managing the property and um, you know asked us to come and look at it because she wanted to sell. And so we, I led. So so basically, it was we closed on the eighty unit deal. Um, Nate was looking at other properties. We went toward this 44 unit townhome, you know, that this young woman owned. And, you know, he said, this looks like a great property, tons of value add. However, I don't have capacity. So Josie, you run it. And I did. So I took one down um, and it was, we've got a million dollar renovation budget on it. It's again, built in the sixties. So, you know, having gone through that iteration uh, a a bit, we, um, yeah, we're, we're just kind of tipping the scale, um, you know, with renovations on that and about to start some exterior work as well. So it's, I mean, uh, you're doing, you know, some fairly decent sized renovation plans for, you know, I mean, these are not, you know, lipstick on a pig type things. I mean, you're saying, I think you said a 40 unit property, a million bucks, that's, you know, pretty substantial. What have you found that's been helpful in like, managing all these construction deals, you know, staying on top of contractors, making sure work they say is getting done is actually getting done, you know, staying on budget, making, you know, staying on time. You know, what have you found that's helped you there? Yeah, mostly finding the right person from the get-go. Um, you know, there was a a vested um or vetted contractor that my partners had worked with um who I met you know, right off the bat and we're working with him as well, but finding the right team, but then, you know, just the constant communication, you know, we've got um, regular updates. I'm out there once a month, you know, walking the property, he's texting me, you know, do you want this finish or this, you know, that type of thing when I'm not there. Um, You know, I'm also very close with the property manager as well. And, you know, we just kind of run through, you know, the whole Gantt chart of a, a, a project management plan where, you know, you've got different phases and you kind of attack things from, from different places. Um, but it, I mean, it really, it's really tricky to find a contractor, you know, you know, just by Googling, you know, them and, and being able to trust them. I think, there was a reputation here that kind of preceded um, the gentleman I'm working with on the, uh, this property and it's uh, really held up. So mm-hmm. the project management background that you brought to the table, more or less, uh, what tools or, or systems can you, you know, for listeners, selfishly myself and Chris, I'm sure what, you know, one or two things that you can tell listeners that, you know, these are things in the project management role that are going to make your life a lot easier. Obviously there's the people component where you're going to have to be there, right? You're going to have to talk to people, but what, you know, uh, checks and balances can you put in place and things that you could implement? Because Chris said, you know, these are, these are not, you know, 2,500 to $4,000 unit renovation. These are 20, you know, 15, $20,000 per unit budgets, across properties, which is pretty extensive. I mean, it's something that we do. Uh, what, are, what are things that you can implement, you know, in such a short time across so many projects to keep the bus going forward? Yeah, so it's interesting. I left um, a large engineering firm and they had all their own in-house software and tracking and systems, you know, that project management systems that talk to accounting and all of these things. And if 
I've recreated tools that work for me. Um, and that includes, I call my stabilization plans, but essentially my project management plan. I, I have done some on Asana, um, you know, but I tend to default to spreadsheets. And I just, um, I list out timeframes and then, you know, budgets. I've got my draw schedule as well. But I think for keeping things on track, I I've got a weekly list of KPIs that I'm looking at with each of my, I have a, a meeting with the contractor and then a meeting with the property manager each week talking about their respective fields and, and just go through, you know, what, um, how many units are we working on? Where are you at in terms of, you know, in terms of the plan for each unit, you know, and essentially when we approach a property that has, essentially the same scope of work for each of the units, you know, it, on the 44 unit, we're doing six, six units at a time. And that's a little tricky sometimes when we're talking about transitioning tenants. Um, But we just kind of hit it from what makes the most sense, you know, uh, in the beginning, but yeah, we, I get a basic scope of work and then I just keep up to date on where we're at with those. And we've had a couple you know, backups with um, materials, you know, cabinets, I think we had back ordered, it slowed us down. The deep freeze that Kansas City and Texas, the whole country had that, that just shut things down for like, you know, a week and a half. Um, But I just, yeah, I I kind of stay in the details and keep track as, as we move forward, you know, and check things off. But I really, so I was an asset management consultant and I love knowing exactly where we are with um, renovations, you know, I think there's probably, um, I probably could take a step back from where I am, but I want to know in each unit, like, did this unit get new cabinets? You know, what was the plumbing like? You know, what are we doing windows here? Do we need to, you know, is this going to be for phase two? Because I do think, you know, looking at these properties and the renovations, There's the work that you do up front that is the most important for turning the property, but there are some things that you put in a next turn, a next round, you know, and that, you know, like in my property in Lawrence, that's going to be windows. We're just going to pick that up on maintenance, you know, the next time it turns over in a year or, you know, year and a half. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm kind of, you know, I kind of remade a bunch of the tools that I was used to working with um, that I left uh, in my, in my with my corporate career and um, just kind of track as we go. No, I I can honestly say that the attention to detail, just from the, you know, the conversation we're having people listening have to realize that these deals are made or made or broken on the details that Josie is doing, right? What she's implementing across the board, keeping schedules, you know, that's how the wheels fall off the bus is when they miss a unit and they miss a unit. Next thing you know, you're doing four units a month when you plan six, you know, it, you know, the next month it adds, it adds, it adds. And that's what deters it. And when you're paying interest on a loan and with renovation schedules and draws and budgets, those are the things that need to happen. So, you know, would I recommend someone diving into six projects with heavy lifts? Well, if you have the right team or, or you've done it in the past, because these deals are so contingent upon the attention to detail and making sure the contractor's doing what he has to do and management. Because if management stops leasing or management takes their eye off the ball with getting notice to vacates out and the contractor, you know, keeping those two people in the same lane going forward is not as easy as it sounds, you know, on a 20 unit. Now, let alone a 44, an 80, a 60, you know, and now if you go to the bigger projects, 200, 300, it doesn't get easier. You know, it may get easier but it's the same principles that you can take across and, and, you know, extrapolate that out. So I think it's extremely impressive, um, especially through a pandemic, obviously people have to understand that, but, but those are the things that need to take place to make these projects successful. So you're doing it and and I don't want to say downplaying it, but, but you're doing a great job across multiple projects, keeping it going because those are the things that are important, you know, for the successful, you know, operation of a project. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, it's, it's fun, but it is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why, you know, so many people want to get into, you know, the heavier turn deals. Cause it's, you know, you take something from old and you make it look new and nice. And I think that concept is obviously really nice, 
Um, but it's pretty tough to actually stay on top of and keep track of because there's a lot of different moving parts. I mean, the first deal I bought down here is a 16 unit and it's been a real lesson learned for me just staying on top of all the different things because we're probably spending about uh, $16,000 a unit redoing the interiors um, and also doing new plumbing on top of it included in that. And all those moving parts has just been an experience for me really learning you know, how to stay on top of things, how to keep track of different things. And, you know, smartly or stupidly, I haven't figured out yet. I didn't go with the GC. I decided to try to figure out the different parts myself because I'm locally. So, you know, working with the cabinet guys and they're going to install it and, you know, the flooring and the paint and, you know, the parts installers and, you know, the, the appliances and stuff. So, um, you know, I think if it was a little bit bigger, I would have gone with the GC just to kind of have some of it overseeing, but even just staying on top of all the different moving parts is not easy by any means. So definitely, you know, there's a very big difference between buying a deal and putting in $3,000 a unit just to put in new appliances and flooring versus a deal where you're ripping everything out, putting things in new, um, you know, coordinating all those different parts, uh, especially because too, once you start ripping stuff out and doing things, you know, new problems come up that you may not have seen otherwise. So I think it's, it's really important that as people start to evaluate and look at that, those things that, you know, it's really understood. I think one of the bigger problems too, is when people look at that is they don't understand how much more risk is involved and they're looking for very similar type returns, maybe a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a really big contraction on like the expected returns of those type of deals where you hear people want like, you know, Oh, I want the 16 IRR over five years or over three years. And it's like, do you really want that return when they're doing all this work and all this stuff can go wrong? I mean, you know, we heard about your first deal where just, you know, a couple things that were just missed in an older deal or were kind of hid from you potentially, um, you know, that stuff happens. And, you know, the more stuff you got going on, the more things you have moving, um, you know, the riskier it becomes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, when you're doing these projects, are these deals that you guys are looking to like, get in and out of, or are you guys looking more for like legacy properties where you can come in, fix everything, you know, get a new loan on the property and just hold it for the long term? Yeah. The latter, you know, we're looking to, you know, do really good solid work to improve the properties and then hold them, you know, for the long term. Two of my partners are um, in tech jobs. I would say that they want a runway so that they can, you know, move on from that. And I think that they both separately are at a place they could move on and they're, they're planning to here shortly. Um, but with that, we're looking at these as not a temporary, you know, a quick fix. Um, we want to, you know, to acquire, to improve, and then to really operate efficiently, you know, for many, many years and to do right by our investors as well. Mm -hmm. So, yep. And, for the value add, of course, we'll get into better um, more permanent debt, you know, in, in the future. Mm -hmm. And when you have that conversation and you're raising money, do you get any pushback from people saying, hey, even if you refinance and give me money back, my money is going to be tied up with you guys indefinitely? Like, do you guys have a lot of pushback when you're having those conversations? Or do you feel that because this is what you say you're going to do, you found people that are looking for that and they are okay with tying up money for you know, years and years and years, if not, you know, decades. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, we have a lot of investors who really like the value add deals um, because they see on the back end that there's that potential for return. So even if, you know, I call it, um, you know, we kind of go through the valley of darkness when when you have a property that's not going to cash flow as you are turning it, you know, um, investors understand that. And there may be a bit more sophisticated investors than someone who might just be getting into um, multifamily investing, but they understand, you know, the upside, you know, in the long term. Um, so no, we've, we've, we've been very fortunate to have a number of investors who have invested with us uh, over and over again. And, and there's, there's many others who want to get into these deals and we're not doing huge deals. You know, we're not doing, you know, the 200 unit raise 20, you know, $20 million deal, you know, raise $5 million. Um, so, you know, we tend to 
to do pretty well with the value add properties, especially, like I said, the 42 unit, you know, it's, you can raise up to, you know, $950,000, you know, with our track record and the track record of my partners pretty quickly. Um, And then the stabilized properties, I'm also finding some people really want that cash, you know, flow right away. And what on this 60 unit property, it's a $2 million raise. um, But we have, you know, a couple anchor investors that are bringing the majority of that right off the bat. And that was surprising to me because as I'm, you know, launching my business, you know, and, and working with my partners, I haven't put myself out there in a huge way. And that's intentional. I don't, you know, I don't want to be the next big, you know, real estate investor. I actually want some balance in my life, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but I've put a, a, enough out there and I've got a really established, you know, profile on LinkedIn based on my, you know, pr- professional experience as, um, you know, a military leader, as well as an uh, executive at a Fortune 500 company. And so I was really conscientious, conscientious of transitioning to full-time investor, but through a little bit that I have done there, I've had people reach out who are just, they're looking, they're, you, you know them, they're the investors who like, they're like, I, I have this cash, I want to invest it, I want the returns, I want to retire, and mm-hmm. you know, I move forward. So we've been really fortunate, you know, having been able to find kind of both types of investors, you know, for the deals that we have. Gotcha. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, I think that's probably a really great place to wrap up. Um, you know, I think you've given everybody a ton of insight and knowledge. So thank you so much for coming on, Josie. If people want to, you know, get in touch with you, learn more about you, follow along, where can they do all that stuff? Yeah, probably the best place is uh, my website, which is waypoints with an S, waypointsequity.com, as well as on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I'm Josie Heron, uh, H-E-R-O-N on LinkedIn. I think I'm Josephine there. It's much more official, but, um, you know, that's a, uh, that's a good place to, to reach me, or you can reach me at my email, which is Josie, J-O-S-I at waypointsequity.com. Awesome. And yeah, definitely reach out. I look forward to connecting. Yeah, for sure. Guys, anybody listening, definitely go hit her up. Uh, definitely connect with her on the different platforms. Um, she's going to be ton of knowledge and resources and stuff. So definitely pick her brain. Uh, But thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you are not already subscribed, it would mean the world to John and I, if you would do so. And if you are, please send it to someone that would get a tremendous amount of value from this episode. Josie, once again, thank you for coming on. This was great. Yeah. Thank you, Chris and John. This was really, really awesome being here with you.